Our scripture reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 4, verse 6. And this passage just happens to include my all-time favorite verse, so if I stumble through it, it's because it really moves me. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all lowliness and meekness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. May God bless us with understanding of his word. Amen. We are taking a moment this morning to reground ourselves and regroup. Um, because what we are asking of each other and what we have covenanted with each other and following Christ and taking on this discipleship journey as our journey is sometimes just really hard to do. Um, and, and would life be a little bit easier? And would there be a better system um, for learning and growing and deepening than having struggles um, that we run up against? Um, for better or for worse, this is where we are and who we are and whose we are. And the important thing to know is we are not the first church or group of people to have struggled. Um, in the very formation of the church, even the people who lived and walked with Jesus himself struggled and had trouble. Um, this letter finds us in one of those struggles in the early church, and this is Paul writing to folks who are really having trouble letting the Gentiles in and seeing the Gentiles as being a part of the family. Remember, this was a Jewish movement. Like, people aren't even labeled Christians yet. And we all know how diverse our Christian family has now become through the centuries. It's a hard thing that we are calling to and that we are asking of one another. And, and so we're going to take a moment as a church family to regroup um, and to take our struggle to Scripture um, to hear a word from God. And so I ask that we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit because that is who Christ promised us, to be our advocate um, and to guide us into all truth. And this is what we do together when we hit a road bump. We take it to our Savior and to the living word and the revelation that we have in Scripture to take a deep breath and to figure out a way forward together. Yes, um, our particular struggle right now might not be yours, um, but you interact with humans in your life, and where there are humans, there is struggle. Um, so our hope is that you can take um, how we, as a church family, um, go to Christ and to Scripture 
to find next steps and to find um, and grow a spirit within us um, to be able to be healthy and whole with how we confront um, struggle when it comes in our lives. So for Paul and for the early church, we start not with the struggle, but why we signed on to this discipleship journey in the first place. Barry, would you bring up the um, first slide of scripture? Um, and so we're looking at who Christ is and what God does within us and through us. And we remember that every family in heaven and on earth is named through God. So, you know, we have our own struggles in our own families that we're aware of, and Paul's expanding it even more, not just all of God's children on earth, but all of God's children in heaven and on earth, the entire community of saints that we are a part of. And so we ask, um, as Paul is asking, that God grant us to be strengthened with might through God's spirit in the inner person. Women, we get to be strengthened too. Um, and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith so that we find a rooting and a grounding and a power in love that we can begin to comprehend with all of our family in heaven and on earth the breadth and length and height and depth of who God is and what God is about. And that is what will bring a fullness and an excitement. And so now we get to Alexa's favorite verse, the next slide, Barry. And this is what it is all about. It's, and I'm going to quote what Alexis just came and was talking with me in my office. Because this um, verse just builds on each other. And so this is Alexa preaching at the moment. Um, that not only is it Christ who we have and Christ who will do what we think, but Christ will do what we ask. But Christ will do more than what we think or ask. Not just more, but far more and far more abundantly. And and the way that that all happens is through the power at work within us. And so there is expansiveness and a breath in this moment. And in Alexa's preaching words, this is the sum of our gospel in one verse. Thank you, Alexa. Um, so this is all of who we are and all of the wonder and the joy that we expect and that we look from. Because we all know that we have our good days and we have our bad days. And there are the pieces of us that we are good at and we have down. And there are the other pieces of us that we're like, maybe somebody else can do that because that is so not me. We serve a Savior who is able to work in us and through us and with us and in spite of us. Because we serve someone who is more than us. Far abundantly more. And that is our hope. And that is our faith. Because in this discipleship journey, there are going to be times when we can go only so far. And that's okay. Because we let God take care of the rest. We are a family as hard as it is sometimes um, because we need each other. Because there will be times in our life when we are not able to pray or to sing because we hurt so much and we are so despairing. But we come and we gather anyways so that there can be others beside us who are praying and are singing and are holding that faith and witness for us and to us. Until that day when we untangle a little bit, when the raw edges of our grief are smoothed a little bit, and we are able to enter just a little bit more into the fullness that God has for us. This is the thing that is beautiful, that is both and. This is what we have promised each other. Turn to page 35, if you will, in these blue hymnals. It's our baptismal covenant. 
Whenever anyone becomes baptized, there are three historic questions that we as the United Methodist Church ask and that all churches ask. One, do you renounce, do you say no to the spiritual forces of wickedness? This is on page 34. We're prepping for our part on 35. Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of our sin. Because if we say yes to Jesus, there's something that we say no to. And this is what we say no to. And then the second question is what we say yes to in our baptism. Accepting the freedom and the power that God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And then the next question is the only way we are ever going to be able to do that is through the power of Jesus Christ. If we put our whole trust in his grace and serve him as our Lord in union with each other, with the church that Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. This is exactly what the early church was struggling with. And this is something that we will keep wrestling with as God keeps rewriting us and our identity to more and more be his children and his disciples. And so when a person is baptized, this is the affirmation that they make for themselves if they're old enough to do so, or their parents and sponsors make for them if they're an infant. And then on page 35 is our part as the church. Do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. That's what we do every Sunday when we gather here to recenter ourselves and who we are and whose we are. And we do that by promising to nurture one another in the Christian faith and life, including these persons. And in if we were doing a baptism now before us, which in this setting and reaffirming our covenant is each other. And so it is only with God's help that we know how to proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We commit to surround each other with a community of love and forgiveness so that we can all grow in our trust of God and be found faithful in our service to others. And so we pray for each other that we may all become a true disciple that walks in the way that leads to life. Sometimes it gets tricky, and that's what we've experienced here lately, um, in that since we haven't been able to find people who are willing to volunteer for children's church, we've had to have the whole family in us, which has made worship a little rough, um, because there are some differing needs. Um, to quote um, Bill and Brenda Myers when I was visiting them a couple weeks ago, we're family, um, and Brenda was discovered, was discussing it, describing it, that's the word I wanted. <laughs> Brenda was describing it as her kids and that next generation living differently than she and Bill do, and their kids living even differently than their parents do. And so there's a little bit of a gap that can come with generations. But what's important is that we all know that we love and that we respect each other. And so Brenda shares that um, when um, she was going in to get um, something looked at, her both of her kids were there immediately to the point where they were maybe there a little too much and she would have been okay with them not quite loving her that much on that particular day. But we are family. And so even when there's a little bit of difference or distance, we still gather because we are there for each other. As we figure this out together, I want to lift some ways in which we do that. We have Children's Church today um, because of Kim Ayers, who has agreed to anchor and to plan this, and we just need another volunteer. And, and I will say this is, um, she feels called to this. I will say this is not sustainable for Kim to miss every single Sunday of worship so that she can do this. So in our end goal is to get someone who will plan with her and then someone else um, and a, a role of volunteers who will come in so that we can have two adults at the same time. But for the moment, Kim's got that anchor. 
Um, and Lee was discussing having some trouble in worship um, and then went and prayed. And I've asked everyone for permission to share this in, in the sermon. Um, but then went pr and prayed and came back to me the next week. And she's like, well, I prayed. I knew I shouldn't have, but I did. <laughs> and so now I want to volunteer. Um, and, and that is who we are um, as family. Um, Kay also, Don and Kay, um, have been worshiping with us, and on that Bible Sunday where we had an entire service geared towards the kids receiving their Bibles, um, Kay was talking in the fellowship hall um, down below and was like, man, when I received my Bible, they just handed it to me and that was it. <laughs> but this is a day that our kids will not ever forget. And so part of being the worshiping family is figuring out that give and take. And what I am asking from us, and what we'll be talking about at our Tuesday meeting, um, and I want everyone who is able to, to come, um, is how we commit to a goal of being fed 75% of the time in worship, and to intentionally give up 25% to meet someone else's 75%. Um, this is what Lee is doing and volunteering once a month for Children's Church. She'd rather be in worship, but she sees a need. And so one out of the four months, that 25%, right, she's giving up to meet someone else's need. That's who I want us to be as a family. And that's who we can be um, with the love of God working through us so that we can bear with one another in love, so that when something rubs us wrong or makes it really hard um, to feel safe or comfortable or welcome in worship, we can turn that into a conversation that we have with each other, of checking in with each other, of how we can help, of how we can be present for one another, so that we can fulfill our covenant to nurture each other and to grow one another in our discipleship journey. I want to close with just how we talk about unity um, in our family. Um, it's hard, and so we start with just taking a deep breath and patience um, and tolerance, but I want our end goal to be celebration of our differences um, and, and to know how that expands us and how that deepens us so that we have a taste of that far more abundantly than God promise, that God promises us. Um, and I want to share a personal example with you. I'm a dancer, and so I'm going to put this in dance terms because we're not the first church that has wrestled with this. In fact, at my last appointment, I was meeting with a spiritual director, um, frustrated and trying to untangle some things, and my spiritual director put this in the dance terms for me and said, Kate, at this service, you get to salsa. <laughs> All right, you get the syncopation, you get the engagement, you get the play and the back and forth, and it's a little loud, um, and there's a lot of improv, and you get that level, right? At this other service, you get to waltz. It's a beautiful dance, too. It's a little more structured. There's a set form, but there is a calmness and a centeredness in that rhythm that settles into who we are. We dance differently. And what I would ask is that we take a deep breath and watch the different dance, maybe even try a bit of the different dance, but that above all, we do a little fusion together in our 75, 25% split. Because I will say, when I'm out salsa dancing, there is nothing I hate more than people who don't, I'm gonna have a soapbox, I'm gonna have a geek out moment, than people who don't know the salsa form um, and don't know how to keep in control of their body but think they've got this and so they're spinning out in their stilettos and I have to go home with a bleeding and bruised foot because they stomped right on me. It doesn't make for a fun night. And so I want there to be some form and some awareness. Um, but on the other hand, there is this guy at um, Ted Hodap 
at, and Ted, if you're watching, here's your call out. Um, at Glen Echo Park, Spanish Ballroom, there would be waltzing in between the contra dances. And it was always beautiful, but there was this guy who could always combine these fun dips and, and even aerials, even jumps, um, that were a little more salsa-esque than waltz, um, into the waltz. And it was always in response with the music that was going on. Um, and so I would love for our waltzing also to have little moments of spontaneity that respond as the spirit moves, and that we find the Epworth fusion, that we find where we are best, and that we celebrate that and we live into that far more abundance with all of who we are. Because we are Christ's family and we are Christ's disciples and the world needs us. So may we give all of who we are for God to accomplish far more abundantly through us than we can ever imagine. Amen. <laughs>